It's Monday, May 23rd, 2011. I'm Rim, and this is Geek Nights. Tonight, corporate training. Let's do this. So last night, we're hanging out, you know, fancy dinner, hanging out on the town, and uh, we start talking about My Little Pony. Mm -hmm. just comes up, but the conversation, pretty much, ponies come up, and then Scott is like, Oh my God, let me tell you all the reasons why My Little Pony is awesome. One, two, three, four. It was an How escalating else? conversation. You got to convince people, otherwise they don't believe. <laughs> I don't know, it was, a, it was a surprising expression of enthusiasm not often seen from Scott. Okay, but anyway, let, it, let me go through many small opening bits. Yeah, it, a lot of stuff happened this weekend. Well, I'm not going to go, th- I'm not going to blow my whole load. I'm going to only use three. Gonna save some of the load. I'm going to just use three small opening bits from today, right? Opening bit number one. No. Nope. Warm today. Warm today, indeed. You know what? I didn't bike this morning because it was still wet. Also, the truth for me as well. But I got new hiking boots because this weekend I'm going to climb another Mile High Mountain. Uh, good so, for you. So uh, I had to wear them in. So I just ran home from work in my jeans. Okay. And it didn't take that long. All right. Uh, number two on the subway platform this morning on the way to work. Uh-huh. Uh, there was a crazy guy, but you know how crazy, like yelling crazy. There's crazy guys all the time, but this yeah. guy was particularly crazy. That's but why. What, I'm I mean, me- that's what, why I'm mentioning him. If he was just regular crazy, he wouldn't have been noteworthy. So what manner of crazy? I mean, there's the agitated crazy guy who's like bothered about something. There's just the screaming, yelling, like crazy woodly woo guy. There's the like quiet rocking themselves. Someone should call the police and you know take care of him. Crazy. Check on the first two, but not the third one, right? Nah, so, so yelling and crazy. So I, I get there, and there's a guy, and I he's there's a guy sitting on the bench, and there's a guy basically bent over, saying something at him a whole lot, and I can't really make it out because I got my headphones in, and also when I took the headphones out, you couldn't really make out what the guy was saying anyway because he was a crazy guy. Have it a jibbity jubilee. Pretty much, yeah. But he was he was yelling jibbity jubilee. All right. So I put my headphones in and I ignore him. All right. Because you can't get involved with that shit. Nope. Eventually, the guy sort of stops bending over and getting in the other guy's face. And but the crazy guy, he, you know, once he gets out of the guy's face, he's basically jumping up and down a little bit, yelling his javity jubilee. Was he waving his arms? No, but he had a cane and he was he was basically jumping and stomping and shaking. It, it's like he was. It's like he had punches in him, and he was releasing the punches without punching anything, right? <laughs> but then he got like he got a little more crazy, like he was pointing his cane at people and getting kind of weird. And then when the train showed up, like he like went up. There was this girl standing next to me, and he basically goes behind her and pushes the air, but like but like he was gonna push her onto the tracks. Whoa! Which were, which there were, was. There was a big rash, well, not a big rash, but there was a time when that was a danger. There was a small rash of crazy people just pushing people onto the tracks. Yeah, but it's like the train was already there, but he like he pushes the air. That's not like, good. That, that guy's practicing. And the girl like was like, eek. That guy's training. <laughs> yeah. But it's like, well, it's a crazy guy. Watch out crazy guy and the third thing uh there's a place i eat lunch sometimes called fresh and co and they got uh salad and sandwiches and the sandwiches they have are pretty good like they're not they won't fill you up that much but they're pretty cheap like six seven bucks and they put them in this incredibly hot convection oven and they taste they have like the most flavor of any sandwich that you can get in the area Uh um so they were tweeting they were like trivia win lunch and i won lunch by direct messaging a tweet so I got I got a sandwich and a water. Well, that's how I got those uh, tickets to Scott Pilgrim. It wasn't because of fancy industry connections or anything. I just won the Midtown Comics contest by tweeting. Yeah. Because apparently everyone's really slow at actually tweeting if something happens. Yeah. So no, it was, so I actually you know so I was just asked my coworker what the answer to the trivia was and I, I just got it. I got a minor geek bite. Consider it a review of an app. Because you see, until recently, I had the Palm Pre. Which had no apps to review. Yeah, now, well, there was one app because what I really needed, one of the killer apps for a smartphone for me, was using GPS data to gather statistics, like heat maps of where I go, you know, if I go hiking or running, seeing a map of like how far I went, how long I went. If I'm like exploring and I find a weird thing, I can look back on the map and see where I was. And I couldn't use latitude or anything. So I ended up using this thing called Smart Runner. Mm-hmm. And it kind of sucked, mm. but it was the best one there was, and On a lot pre- of people use it, and it was free. I could pay free is for the right like, price. I mean, I could have paid for like more stuff, but the stuff it offered was kind of dumb, and it had this website. It all worked pretty well, except the app just kind of sucked. 
So I get my new phone. I install Smart Runner on it because I already got a ton of data in it. Yep. And it still sucks. It wasn't that it sucked because it was on the pre. It just sucks. <laughs> it's a free like, shitty app. What do no, you but even the pay app isn't any better. You just get more features on the site. Okay. Not in the app. All right. You got to pay for like a membership to the site to what, get the... What sucks about it? So you'll be running. You just turn it on, right? And first, it just never seems to get a GPS sync. <laughs> Like, it just doesn't use the API correctly. Okay. Meanwhile, I turn on, like, Latitude, immediate sync. Maps, immediate sync. Smart Runner, red, 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 red. So it's just a poorly coded piece of shit. Or it would be like, you're good to go, Rim. And I'd be like, okay, Smart Runner, and I'd start running. And then I'd get home after, like, three hours of running, and I look, and it had lost the sync, like, ten feet out and not recorded anything else. Uh-huh. Yeah. So... I was looking on the App Store. Sounds like not-so-smart runner. Yeah. So I was looking on the App Store, and I realized that Google does everything great. So I just typed Google into it, and I just downloaded every Google app that would do anything I wanted. That was made by Google? Yes. Yeah. Actually made by Google. That's usually the best thing to get. Uh, you have a Google phone with a Google OS and a Google account. Because so none of that I, stuff could every, be used by me every, before. Uh, every app written by Google is probably going to work pretty well. So, of course, you know, Google Translate is just great. I said, oh my, wamo shinderu in it, and got it immediately. Works exactly the same on iPhone. Yep. Yep. And then I got, I didn't even know this existed, Google Tracks. Mm -hmm. Google Tracks is basically everything the smart runner pretended to be, but actually works really well. Like, Let me see if that is an available option. And basically, it's Google Latitude on crack. You can set it to like what interval you want it to do GPS updates. It draws this like perfect line of where you are and altitude and grade and speed and it's just and it's all you can just export all the data for free to whatever format you want. It's just it's fucking awesome. Oh, Google Tracks does not exist for iPhone. Oh, so sad. Oh, wow. So sad. So, yeah, Google Track, if you're looking for anything to track where you go in any kind of generalized sense, really just use Google Latitude and Google Track. Everything else sucks. Mm, okay. Yeah. So, uh, that was my bite. It's, right. Thursday, it's uh, Tuesday. Monday. It's Monday. <laughs> it's, it is Monday. I think that's like the best inside joke of Geek Nights is that whenever we record a show on the wrong day, later, early, we all, we never keep it hidden. Even though we act like we're going to keep it hidden, but we don't. You yeah, know, we always like backdate it. Like, like oh, yeah, yeah I put this it up is, on This Monday. is the show for the 23rd of May 11, recorded on the 24th of May 11. <laughs> yep, because we did something fun. Anyway. Uh, so, yeah, there's this big deal going around about a patent troll that went after people making apps for the iPhone and the iPad. And basically, now, this sort of thing happens all the time. All the time. So what happened here is that uh, Apple added a feature to the, uh, the app uh, API that you could make an app that had in-app purchases, which means you buy an app, and the app might even be free, but then in the app you might buy something else. So, like, you could have uh, a Farmville, and then in the Farmville buy a plow for five bucks, right? So they added that feature. So apparently that feature is patented by a company named Lodsys, which is a patent troll. Yep. Uh, they don't actually make anything. They just yeah, have I mean, You can pretty much always tell the patent trolls because they'll have a patent on something stupid that everyone already does. And they don't actually have any products but lawsuits. Right. So Lodsys sent out a bunch of cease and desist letters to people, not Apple, but to companies that made... Uh, apps using this, you know, in-app purchase feature. A common tactic. The, the the biggest thing a patent troll will do is usually go after a, a lot bunch of, of small fry who can't do anything because those people can't fight against it. They'll usually settle, or they'll might they might fight it, and they'll often lose because they don't have the resources to fight it. One guy, thus lending legitimacy to the patent whatever. lawsuit. So then they go into the final lawsuit. They point back to all the people who settled or all the people who yeah. they lost. One guy suggested right that when things like this happen, that uh, it's a risk. He said it's a risky move. He admitted it. But one strategy might be to get all of the people who receive cease and desist letters to file on the, at the same exact time. And it would cost about 2000 per person to do this filing. But by filing all at the same time in unison, the troll would be forced to respond to all of those on the same day at incredible expense. And that, that expense could actually outweigh any possible, you know, increase. So instead of settling with the patent troll and giving them, you know, thousands multiplied by everyone they sent a letter to, you could give that you could give a few thousand to a bunch of lawyers all over the place. And basically the patent troll would be crushed. All right. And they wouldn't get anything. But anyway, 
Um, so Lods just sent out these letters, and then it was quiet for a while as all these app developers didn't know what the fuck to do. And then Apple finally came out today, and they were like, they sent a letter to Lodzis, and the letter was basically like, look, we licensed your fucking patent, we gave you money already, and here is the, here in, in fact is the text of that patent license that we bought from you. And look, it says that we can transfer the license to this, from this patent to our app developers. So fuck you, right? Uh, stop harassing our developers or else. Uh, and I imagine Apple has enough money to... To fight Lodzis. Now, but again, I want to ask the question. Why did Apple license it in the first place? Why didn't Apple just buy Lodzis outright? It why probably did... was cheaper to settle with them. But it's like, if you license the patent, you're going to have to keep licensing it until the patent is is done for, what is it, 14 years? Something like that? Yeah, still probably cheaper. And but also, I buy... think there's a more fundamental question. Why do patents like this even exist? Why don't, and it's like, I know that all the tech companies basically have, have armies of patents and that they all use, they're all defensive patents, right? It's like, if I have enough patents against IBM and IBM has enough patents against me, then we can't sue each other because then we'll both open up our, you know. Yep. I mean, I filed, you know, there was huge pressure when I worked at IBM to get patents and I actually filed a stupid patent because I was kind of told to by my bosses and it's a stu the stupidest thing ever. But yet, due to the way patents work and our messed up system of what is patentable, it was eminently patentable to write a bash script that will look at the hardware of a system and come up with a unique identifier to then be ba to be based on the MAC address to be used as a temporary DNS name for loading a box. Uh huh. Yeah. What kind of BS is that? That's the patent I filed. That's complete bullshit. Yep. But yeah, uh, it's like even if the patents exist, if these companies all, all the tech companies really hate the patents and they're really, you know, being honest that they just want them for defensive purposes, then IBM, Microsoft, Google, Apple, that should be enough. Maybe throw Oracle in there. If those five get together and just say, all right, all our pat, let's, you know, let's take all our patents and we'll all simultaneously put them in the shredder, right? Then No, that because then... The patent trolls. No, then they use their money to buy the patent trolls no. and put those in the shredder too. No, because buying the patent troll means they still win. They get their money. That's all they want is money. No, because here's the thing, right? So you are a pet. You own a patent troll company. Yes. I buy your company. Yep. I fire you. Uh, you buy my company. I cash out. No, the 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 money is. Part is the company's money. It's not your money. Yeah, and I, you know, maybe the board of directors on a patent troll company like that, they probably don't even have shareholders. Or if they do, it might be a small number. But it's like if you have Rimco and I buy Rimco oh, for right, a, so a how, million my, dollars, that yeah. million dollars is property of Rimco, not property of Rim. Uh, and then I fire Rim. Now Rim is a homeless bum. Uh, Scott, wait a minute. You're, you're not quite understanding how buying a company works. Okay. So if I buy a startup company for a million dollars and the money is the company's, then by your logic, I just get that money back, and I got the company for free. Well, no. Because the money comes back in the company. But it goes to the people who, you know, who? own. Who does it go to? The shareholders of Rimco. Uh, yeah, so Rimco, the patent troll, is probably just me, and I probably only have three but, employees. But a lawyer, <laughs> an engineer, and another lawyer. Well, that's, you know, I assume that there would be like, all, you know, a, it would be a publicly traded one because you, if it was private. So is this company publicly traded? You can I, look that have, up right now. I have no fucking clue. Because <laughs> uh, even if it is, how many shares are there? And two, what do the shareholders and the board of directors want? I mean, you could pay out a dividend to all the shareholders and simultaneously pay a huge bonus to yourself. Yeah, it doesn't look like it's public. And you know what? <laughs> I, I can't find it on Google Finance. I pay myself a huge bonus and then I quit. See, but what, at what point can we, you know, not pay... At what point does the ownership come to me so I can not pay you the huge bonus? But you have to pay me the huge bonus. Who says? I'm the boss. I own the company now. And what exactly does that mean? What's the when's the date of that happening? What contract are you going to agree to? You after know after you before you get the money, I'm the boss. Then Plus, you get remember, the money. Plus, remember, Scott, because I'm a patent holder, my company, I have the right to just say, you know what? Uh, I don't want to be bought, and I'm not going to license this to you. So uh, stop selling your product. Mm. It's not quite as simple as you'd think. And buying the patent trolls. <laughs> just makes being a patent troll super awesome. Yeah, but there has to be a way to just get rid of all of them. There yes. There aren't that many. Yes, there is. It's a very simple way. It's called <laughs> patent law reform. Yeah, well, yeah, that's another. It's, <laughs> that's I'm a, the thing is, I'm basically assuming here, right, that the government is useless as it's been useless and counterproductive. Yes. So, so I'm trying so to Scott, find ways to solve these problems without the government. 
Wait. So <laughs> hear me out. Rather than getting all the big companies who are relatively benign and intelligent and large and techy together and shredding the patents, they should put all of those patents into a consortium. Mm-hmm. that are basically licensed for free to anyone and set up a system where they will only ever be enforced against people who file lawsuits against people who join the consortium. But the thing is, those people who are filing lawsuits, uh, the patent trolls, don't have anything. They're, they're not using any patents because... They might, you know, the consortiums are large enough to where there's a good chance they are. <laughs> also, you'd be very likely able to find a similar or almost identical patent in your own portfolio to hit back with. Maybe. You could sue them for, like, using email to serve a notice about a patent. <laughs> Uh, so there's anyway. an article on Slashdot, and I don't want to get into all the details of what different states are doing, but this is something that's been rumbling for a long, long time. There, and there's a push, and the National Highway Traffic Safety Administration is likely to announce soon regulation requiring these devices in all cars and having penalties for disabling or removing them. Mm-hmm. The devices being black boxes that, in the event of a crash or other you know, in, incident where law enforcement gets involved... Could use a warrant to get the data and analyze it. As long as they had to use a warrant to get it, what's the problem? Yeah, well, let's forget the separate problem that pretty much anything involving technology doesn't need a warrant because our courts and legal system are so fucked up. Yeah, like how they was they ruled that like the FBI doesn't need a warrant to put a tracking device on your car. Yeah, That's so like... let's ignore that problem because that's just an old people run Congress problem. Okay. Independent of that. The idea is that every car has to have a black box, not one that phones home, one that just records the data and only keeps data from the moment of an accident back a certain amount of time. Mm -hmm. You know, telemetry data, whether or not the gas pedal was hit or not, how far it was, whether or not the brakes were engaged, how hard and when, whether or not people... Well, you got to put them in police cars. That's definitely a a, a no question idea right there. Yeah, so the idea is to make it illegal to remove these devices and to put them in every single car. And I... I'm so absolutely for this that I'm giddy. Yeah, it's a great idea. Point the first. I have never caused a traffic accident, but I've been involved in in one traffic accident. Actually, I was rear-ended like five times in high school, but that was all in the high school parking lot because people would run stop signs behind me while I was stopped at them. Mm -hmm. But uh, I'm confident that if I'm ever driving in my entire life and there are black boxes in the cars, I will be able to prove in court that the accident was not my fault. Yep. Two, if we can prove that so who is at fault, we can much better distribute the cost of recovering from traffic accidents. Right. Like if the black, you know, right now we already have, even without these black boxes, really excellent science uh, to determine who is at fault in accidents. Cops, there are cops who specialize in this, and they go, or detectives, and they go down and they measure the skid marks on the road, and they look at the tires on the car, yep. and they, they look at how much damage is done to the car and nearby objects, and they can pretty much 90% like exactly tell you what happened, when, the, how fast they were going when they hit the brake, where, where the car, what, what position it was in when it hit the brake, everything. And that's without the black box. So if they had the black box, it's just like, boom, Boom, set in stone, your fault. You did it. You were, you know, holding this gas pedal all the way down, ignoring the red light. So, point the third. I can't find the article, so you'll just have to take my word at this, but I'm sure you could find it. I read an article, it was years ago, talking about how the vast majority, as in the vast majority, it was like over 90% of traffic collisions in the U.S. were driver error and nothing else. Of course. Driver error is pretty much the cause of almost every fatality on U.S. highways. Of course. And... If we could prove who was at fault, then we could really, in the long run, redistribute the cost of car insurance to the people who are causing the accidents. Mm, I mm. guess. Yeah. Yeah. The thing is, is that really going to happen, though? It, I think it would in the long run. because So, right now, let's say I'm involved in an accident with you on the freeway, and... It's because, your fault. Because there are no witnesses, be my fault. there's no, like, the, the police can't clearly say who was at fault. So they spread the blame 50-50 or 60-40 or something. The insurance companies know, all right, 60-40, and they base their metrics on that. What if the metrics can prove absolutely it was Rim's fault, 100%? Mm-hmm. Then the insurance companies can much more heavily punish me in terms of premiums and not punish you at all. That'd be fine. Yeah. Yeah. I guess there's a lot of outrage from techies about this because they're afraid of government tracking and whatever. Uh, And I don't know. I'm just generally of the mind that certain kinds of surveillance and telemetry and tracking and things like this 
are very beneficial, not not from the angle of if you got nothing to hide, you know, that sort of thing, just from the angle of every envisioning of an altercation I ever see myself engaged in almost always involves someone else breaking the law or being adversarial or being at fault and me wishing I had some way to prove that fact in a court of law. Well, isn't that exactly if you had nothing to hide? You're basically saying, I'm Rim, I'm not breaking the law, so I don't have anything to hide. So what I'm saying <laughs> is that because I have nothing to hide, I personally will make gather all this data and make it available. If I was arrested for some sort of crime, I would do anything to make sure like all that Google Latitude data was in court for people to see. Yeah, sure. Unless I did it. <laughs> 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 but especially because the people who are so worried about this they seem to think that the police are going to start pulling you over and then, like, checking the data to see if you were speeding earlier in the day. They will if you're tickets. black. <laughs> or, like, a lot of people to this day claim that if you have an easy pass, they will send you speeding tickets in the mail. Which, as far as I nah, can tell, has they don't never do, happened. They've never done that. I know. They'll send you drove through the toll booth without paying. They'll like, also send you sped through the toll booth. Yep. If you go through the toll booth at 80 miles an hour, they're going to send you a ticket for endangering the toll booth personnel. Yep. But anyway, I'm for this. I see no reason not to do it so long as, one, you need a warrant to get the data unless the driver gives it up willingly. Yep. And two, they're not accessible from the outside they're a physical device that has to be accessed physically. Yeah. Yeah. But what, what keeps me from... It has to also be secure enough so that the dr the owner of the car can't tamper with it and modify the data. Well, luckily, that would be... It'd be pretty easy to make something like that. And two, having the laws such that... I don't understand how it could be easy to do. I mean, so it's... It, how is it going to check... For example, how would it check the speed of the car? Uh, how do cars currently check the speed? Do you know how any of that works? Yeah, it, it knows how uh, how the diam the circumference of the wheels. Uh, that's and, not how it does it. And it knows how many times the axis rotates. Yeah, so one, if you modify your car, most likely from these articles, there will be laws saying that modifications to cars that would affect the telemetry gathering have to also make sure that they update the telemetry gathering system properly and legally. Right. And you're basically, if... The data but there's no physical way to stop me from fucking with it. Well, from the data itself, the black box, it's really easy to make a physical device that if you mess with it, it just it somehow notes that I've been messed with and nothing more. No, but for example, right, so it has some wires coming out of it that connect to the speedometer. Yep. I can just cut those wires and attach them to a phony spe a thing that simulates a speedometer. Yep. So, and it's always going the speed limit. So in the investigation, you know, you're in an accident, or the police subpoena the data, they physically go to get it, and they discover... The evidence of this tampering. I would obviously fix it before the cops got there. Yeah, so you're in an accident, and then you fix it right there? No, more like, you know, it would obviously be some sort of clever system, right? For example, uh, something I could plug in really quickly, push a button, and it would record, a, it would, you know, re-record a whole bunch of speedometer data, and then I would unplug it and throw it in the woods. So you're, uh, I'm dubious that you'd actually be able to set up something like that. Uh, I don't see how you could stop me from doing something like that. I don't think you could set one up that wouldn't be pretty eminently detectable from the extant evidence on the scene of a crime, for example. Mm, I don't know. Also, by making it a crime to modify the device and basically, like, making that illegal in the and of itself. The thing is, you basically, even if, even if it was detectable, right, I can make it pretty hidden. Like, I could hide it behind, like, the, the numbers on the speedometer or something like that, right? So the cops would then be forced to, like, really take apart every piece of the car you know, to yeah, make right, so sure in that, case, that it was, you know. One, it only matters if you're involved in a case where it did matter. And now you've got intent. You've got all this kind of premeditation. So if you're caught, for example, that is a much more serious crime than simply having broken the black uh, box. But you're assuming if I'm caught, because I'm so clever, I'm actually, I get off the hook. And Scott, now you're 100% uh, Scott, at fault. Scott, so, so let's put it this way then. One, if your readings don't match up with what is seen in the other car's readings, <laughs> that's already a red flag. The other car. If was your the car one. says I only drove thirty, it's a miles reasonable doubt. The other car was the one that tampered with the data. Actually, no, it's probably not because you could because remember what you remember those detectives you talked about <laughs> who were so good. So they investigate the scene. Huh? Scott's box says that he never exceeded thirty-one miles per hour, and yet 
His tires were worn bald and melted slightly, and look at these skid marks. Uh. Oh, and the other car matches perfectly with the extant data. Uh. I could fuck with both cars. My easier argument that I was avoiding until now is that if you're going to argue that we shouldn't do some sort of forensic technique because a really clever criminal might get out of it, so much for our entire legal system. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just saying is that they would I would be, I would sell some sort of uh, devices where you can sell this online where the government can see it and then uh, one no, you know buy your device and see how it works and know what to look for the same place they sell radar detectors and shit yeah radar detectors the police know exactly how radar detectors work I know and you know what they don't that well because everyone uses lidar radar detectors are right. shit but the point is, is that people buy radar detectors anyway so people would buy my black box tamperers oh anyway. so you don't want to help the people you just want to make money no by these are the people causing the accidents i don't actually want to help them unless they're me i just want to <laughs> take their money by selling them hacking devices <laughs> So anyway, things of the day. Got mm -hmm. a thing of the day? I do. I got this. This uh, it's a it's an advertisement. Well, actually, it's a movie trailer, which is the same thing as an advertisement. Really? Yeah. Green? Really? Yeah. So it's this romantic comedy movie, but actually, you know, like there's probably not any romantic comedies that I could think of that I actually care about. Can you even name a rom com? Uh, this one. Name another one. Uh. You can't even name a single movie that you would call a romantic comedy. No. Not one. I mean, you, maybe you could mention a movie and I could tell you whether it was or wasn't. Would you consider, say, Pretty Woman a romantic comedy or is that something else? Uh, maybe. Have you ever seen Pretty Woman? Mm, most of it. Do you know what it's about? A whore. Uh, yeah, technically. Yeah, all right. All right. <laughs> um, so, Scott, you're, you're telling me that you think this movie... A romantic comedy. I see a poster of a guy and a girl like walking through a forest. Yeah, it's called Green, it's times. called Green with Envy. But the trailer, I guarantee, you know, it's like normally, you know, you see trailers for these movies and you're like, whatever. The trailer for this movie is so great. It is so absolutely amazing that it will convince you to watch this movie, even if you are kind of like me and are like would never even consider watching it based on the poster. Really? Guy the, forgets girl's anniversary? That's the plot? The trailer... I'm, I'm reading the synopsis right now. I Guy forgets girl's anniversary. I guarantee you that the trailer to this movie will make you want to watch the movie. 100% guarantee. If you trust me on ponies, you have to trust me on this movie. <laughs> mm. I have seen the trailer, and I kind of do want to see the movie, but well, we'll see. We'll see what you guys think. <laughs> This is, this is an experiment. <laughs> we'll see what people have to say about that. So my thing of the day is a man that Scott probably has never heard of. I know who it is. Do you, do you know what is George Takei famous for? Star Trek. Oh, wow, really? I know. Get... So who do you play in Star Trek? The Asian guy with the blue uniform. Do you know the guy's name? Or what his George position Takei. was? George Takei. Or what his, what, what his position was on the bridge? Token Asian guy. Was he even on the bridge? Uh, the uh, George Washington Bridge? Which Star Trek is he from? The first one. The first one. The first first one? The oldest possible one. You're sure? I'm guessing. Uh, okay, anyway. <laughs> so George Takei is pretty famous for being a gay activist, among other things. You know, actor and whatnot. Also being gay. And for being generally... Because you can be a gay activist without being gay. For being a generally funny dude. And he is... You know, he's, he's also got. He also has lately. like the bestest voice. He has a really good radio voice, and he it's he's like uh, he's just like Peter Fernandez, where he still has it even though he's old. Yep, and he has the radio voice even when he's not radio mic'd. Yep. I mean, Scott and I could have radio voices on Geek Nights, but in real life we don't have radio voices. <laughs> and even in Geek Nights, we don't really have radio voices because we don't really like work at doing the microphone technique, just because it's a pain in the ass to do that. <laughs> but uh, he really, in real life, sounds like that. And basically, Tennessee. If you couldn't, you know, guess, was in a state that may be a little bit homophobic. And they tried to pass a law that basically, well, they are passing a law that doesn't let you talk about gayness in schools. Okay. What if you need to talk about history and there happens to be gayness in the history? I oh, can't bring it up. What if it's part of the curriculum? It uh, can't be part of the curriculum. What if there's a national standardized test that asks about that history that involves gayness? Oh, are you implying that perhaps students in Tennessee are not getting the best education compared to people in other states? I don't think I'm implying. I'm straight up saying. <laughs> so George Takei is 
basically campaigning against this and other things like it on the internet very funnily. And I highly recommend you just it's seek hard out... To, it's hard to take it seriously. Seek out YouTube videos and things related to George Takei, because he's a pretty cool guy. Uh, to quote Wikipedia about him, in November 2010, George Takei released a PSA blasting former Arkansas school board member Clint McCants. In the video, Takei repeatedly called Mr. McClance, quote, a douchebag. <laughs> <laughs> And it it's good stuff. George Takei is a pretty cool dude. Maybe not as cool as the uh, Four Horsemen, but... Uh. So in the meta moment, frosted tips and visors aside, the book club book is still Isaac Asimov's foundation. We'll get to it when we get to it. We're going to be at PAX Prime. We might be at PAX Dev doing a bunch of stuff. Kineticon. Kineticon is upcoming. It's pretty much mostly too late for you to submit your panels yep. because I'm in the midst of scheduling them. Nerd NYC Recess is on Saturday, June 18th. Yep. Uh, Saturday, June 25th and 26th is Game Hack Day in New York City. How you like that? Nah, I was if you have any, If you have any game programming or hacking skills, you should be interested. So what do you do with this event? Hacks games and it's ba programs? Basically, the way hack days tend to work is you, you show up, and maybe you have a team, and you make a hack, you, you make something, and then the day two is usually presenting. Uh -huh. And that's, that's how the hack days tend to be structured. Usually, they're things where, uh, you know, VCs come. Like, this weekend, competing with Bar Camp, there was, like, TechCrunch Disrupt Hack Day. And, you know, it's basically they, VCs want you to make something so they can see who, if someone makes the best stuff, and then they can try to convince them to do startup crap, right? Sounds about right. But this is Game Hack Day, so I, I imagine it will be less of that kind of bullshit and more making cool games that are quirky and awesome. And, of course, follow us on Twitter, join the forum, go to the website. Forum's awesome. People are hanging out in there. Yep. Not much other, other meta going on right Not now. Not really. It's, it's slow meta times. So this week, instead of doing work, I'm taking a Python boot camp for the week. All right. It's actually pretty good. Have you learned anything? I've learned a lot of Python. Do you have any skills? I'm getting there. I actually already, <laughs> in the course of the class, just, you know, because there's a lot of free time during classes, I wrote a pretty simple rules engine, this multi-threaded app that'll take SNMP traps in and send formatted emails out based on a set of arbitrary rules, and I'm working on a web interface for that thing now. Uh-huh. Yeah. It's really easy to program But stuff. is it done well? Eh, it's done okay. <laughs> I'm not a great coder. Yeah, the thing is, it's like, if you really if anyone out there actually wants to learn Python, you can just take... I was telling some people this today, and I've told other people in the past. You can just take classes online for free. Well, you can go to MIT Open Courseware and take CS101 at MIT, which happens to involve Python, and you'll learn a whole lot. If you take that class and you know all the material from that class, you know more than most people who actually are hired as programmers. And you know that's only that's only CS101 at MIT. So if you actually go to MIT, you get 3 more years uh, of that, which is one, two, three, four, five, six, seven more semesters. You that's know what else you can that's do? That's one eighth of the MIT education. You can buy an O'Reilly book and read it and do the stuff in it and learn Python. Yeah, but you know, then you just learn a language, right? The nah, it depends. CS101 it and depends. For example, the Learning Python book, which they sent me a copy of just in course of the training, so I have it. I was reading it. Actually does teach concepts more than it teaches language. Yeah, but the CS101 and MIT is going to teach you... You know. Yeah, well, I guess <laughs> the O'Reilly the book deal. is more for someone, really, who already knows programming concepts, just needs to learn the language, or isn't great at programming, but already know like, as long as you know, like, what objects are and inheritance and, like, the basic concepts of programming. <laughs> but the point is, what, what bothers me is that most training, like, for example, this class, I'm taking it and I'm, you know, I'm, I'm fixing all my Python knowledge. Like, I'm filling in all the holes that I had because I kind of just learned it ad hoc as I had to write stuff out of necessity in the course of my life. The only language I knew really well was, uh, let's see, Perl, because I had to use it a lot at work. Bash. Yeah, Bash, because Said I use that more than anything. Set and Awk, because I use those almost more than anything except Bash. And Visual Basic, because that was the working language in the IT department and at Visual RIT. Basic is so brain dead, anyone can do it. I know, and C Sharp, because I had to write a bunch of SOAP services. So mm -hmm. Python was kind of on the back burner, even though it's actually my preferred language. Like, I like it. I enjoy using it more than every other language I know. Mm -hmm. Yet, I wasn't that good at it, because I don't get a chance to use it that often so i wanted to learn it better i could have just spent a week coding stuff and read through o'reilly books and i would have learned the same stuff i'm learning from this you class. could have spent uh i don't know how many how many lectures there are in the mit open course where we could have done two a day and then done the you know the uh 
done the lessons involved and taken the tests and then in, co- in, the, in the time in between those lessons just worked on a project using the knowledge you just learned. So the trouble is it is very difficult in the modern world, especially in the U.S., if you work for a company and they want you to learn a skill for the company, for them to agree to say, all right, take a week off and, and we'll pay you and learn it. Or come into the office for a week, don't do your normal work, and learn this thing. Very few companies let people do that. Well, I think the reason is is that, you know, we are self-learners, right? I can just learn something, you know. And the other thing is, right, uh, why do you even need to take time off the job to learn a thing, right? So, for example... Uh, Here's a good example. In my job, for mm -hmm. example, a production thing can happen, and I'm the senior engineer. So, if there's a serious problem, they would want to get me involved. So, if I'm in the office... Very often, whatever I'm learning or working on will be interrupted several times per day. No, that's not what I'm asking. What I'm asking is, right, so I needed, I was doing a job once, right, and I needed to do some Ruby. So it's not like I stopped to learn Ruby or I went to Ruby training. I just was, I I was, and needed to do this work. So I started doing the work and learned the Ruby simultaneous to doing the thing I needed to learn Ruby for. Ah, you want to know why? Right? Well, if you, you need, know if why? you need Python for something at work, just Start working on that thing and learn the Python as you do the thing. No, because, Scott, you want to know why? Unless you're actually a developer in a large company, like you're actually like your job is developer, no one ever budgets time to even make stuff with any reasonable span of time to make stuff, let alone learn stuff. So say you have to But the learning is simultaneous at the making. No, because say you have to make a thing. They'll budget it assuming that you'll make it immediately and quickly with tools you already have. So as a result... Like say I could like say there's a huge thing I got to do. I got to parse a bunch of data. I could do it shoddily in Bash really quickly, but I could do it much better and make an extensible thing that would then be very useful down the road in Python. But if I'm not super up on my Python, it would take me maybe an extra day's worth of work to do it in Python because I'd have to reference a lot of materials. I mean, I don't need to look anything up if I'm writing a giant Bash script. I have to occasionally look things up when I'm working in Python, like how's that module work? I have to look things up no matter what I'm using. Yeah, but I have to look things up more. I'm slower. I'll forget, like, oh, right, the iter items. That's how you go through a dictionary and stuff like that. So as a result, very rarely do you have the opportunity to do anything where you'll also learn because... By nature, learning and doing at the same time is slightly slower than doing shittily with something you already know, even if what you do ends up being a worse thing. Mm -hmm. So unless you're a developer, most companies will really never actually give you the opportunity to learn anything for real. Also, I will argue that if you learn only by doing, like, oh, you've got to do that. Like, uh, here's an example from my job. There's a guy, and we have to uh, make a thing, like a script, basically. And say this guy does it in Perl or Python, which he doesn't know. And all right, he'll learn Perl or Python as he's making the thing. Mm. You know, he'll make the thing, he'll learn the language at the same time. Yep. As a result, what comes out is very poorly written. Yeah. And doesn't work that well and crashes. Does it get the job done? Barely. Uh, Is it satisfactory? Does it meet the requirement? Uh, yes, except that no one else could ever interface with it. When I looked at it, but per- is that is interfacing with it part of the requirement? I hope he doesn't listen to this show. But is interfacing with it part of the requirement? Uh, well, no, they don't write requirement documents because people who aren't well, developers. Yeah. Uh, uh, Scott, <laughs> in the real world, unless you're a developer, nobody ever gives you a requirements document. I'm not saying does it meet, and that, there doesn't have to be a document. No, right? there's, but there's no, still there's, a, no, there's an unwritten requirement. Yes, the, but the unwritten requirements are it did the job, and not things like without crashing or. <laughs> Really? That's not part of the unwritten requirement, not crashing? Because well, I'm pretty in my in my eyes, not crashing is part of the unwritten requirement. Yeah, well because if it crashes, you fail. That's what happens when a non developer who doesn't know object oriented principles and doesn't really know programming languages is writing something in Perl. <laughs> and basically, wow, you're iterating through like ten nested arrays. <laughs> okay. Welcome <laughs> here, here's a data dictionary. Do it that way instead. But basically, if people who learn by doing, who don't already know all the fundamentals, will often learn very bad habits. By yep. taking a class or by training, as you know, like budgeting in a project, like, all right, a week of like a Django boot camp and then beginning the requirements building for this Django website the company has to build, it's probably going to be more fruitful for a group of developers than build this and learn it all at the same time. Mm-hmm. Now, here's the other thing, right? If you know, training is all you really need to go from don't know what to do to be able to do the work, 
right? And how long is the training? A week? Uh, yeah, this is a boot camp that basically is aimed at, all right, you're already a programmer. And in the, in the, by the end of this week, you will be a pretty average Python developer. So why the fuck does anyone need to go to school for four years if they can go to boot camp for a week? And uh, then you be know able why? to do the job. You want to know why? Because in, a, in these training things like this, at least all the enterprise ones I've been to that are about programming languages, they assume that you already know all the fundamentals of computer science. If you don't know about like iterations and flow control and data structures and all that stuff, you're fucked. But couldn't they then teach you that in a one-week boot camp as well? Uh, I don't know. You could learn that in less than four years enough to take the, the thing, that's for sure, yeah, right? Yeah, you probably could. So it's like, you know, what's the point, uh, you know, if, if people can just, if training is enough for companies to be willing to let you do something, then why do they, you know, what was the four years of college? All right, Scott, for? why'd you go to RIT? <laughs> for the reasons besides education. Yeah, that's why I went to RIT. Yeah. Here, here's the real benefits of college. You have access to the, stu to the materials you need to actually learn if you want to learn. You meet all the people who will eventually get you jobs. And you get a piece of paper. And you have, and you have fun. And you have a, and there's actually, you know, there are chances to become a professor or, you know, do, there are certain things that you can't do without the advanced learning of the college. But if, if you, if you want to do those things, well, you here, know, let, like let, be a doctor. Let's narrow the discussion a little bit because basically when you think of corporate training, like training, like, all right, I work here, I'm going to technology training for a week or two to learn X or learn Y or, you know, very rarely are classes like that fundamentals like learn object oriented programming or learn conceptual design they're always they're always like, learn this specific product yep or learn this specific acronym learn this tool and i think the the understanding is that in the industry you should already know the fundamentals you, you the, this is kind of training like all right you need to learn this specific thing quickly we're going to teach you the best practices and then you'll be good to go you won't learn bad practices you won't go off in the wrong direction but really I'm starting to feel pretty strongly that the majority of corporate style IT training is bullshit no. and it's only there because companies aren't willing to budget the time or trust their employees to learn on their own to learn stuff. Well, I, don't I think need to be this training if the they thing just is said we if, can if my we know. just told me this if they've just said if they just said all right you don't have to work on anything but learning python really well and writing some apps this week. I would have gotten the same out of it as this multi-thousand dollar course. We both know that either one of us can learn on our own if we want to, right? Everyone I know But other in people, the industry. can they do so? Would you trust some strange guy that you hired that you only know through work for, and you've only wait, wait, you wait, hired so him Scott two won. weeks ago? I would not hire someone that I would not trust to learn on their own unless they were doing menial work, in which case I would never let them get training. Uh-huh. Because the thing is, it's funny. If you actually go to these training things, have you ever gone to like corporate like a week or two training like out at not a week or two but i've gone to you know like individual one day classes things and they were always boring and useless so in those cases how many of the people who were in the class with you clearly didn't want to be there and were, were just surfing the net the whole time and not paying attention the vast majority yeah yeah so if you give someone if you let someone come into the office and learn on their own it's a lot easier to kind of notice if they're actually learning or not than if you send them flying off to Vegas for a week to go to a class where you can't keep an eye on them. And that costs thousands of dollars more and probably has the same effect. Nothing. I just, I'm, I'm kind of sick of corporate training as a thing. Well, I mean, there are times when corporate training could be the real deal, right? I yep. mean, it depends on exactly what you're being trained in. Like, let's say, you know, like you go work at a job and, uh, and there's a machine involved and it's a very, you know, specific machine, like some sort of manufacturing robot or something like that. And it's got all sorts of crazy controls. Well, you're going to pay fucking attention to that training so the robot doesn't, like, rip your arm off. True. Right? You know? But at the and same time, that's operational training as opposed to development training. Is it, they are very different things. You think it's different? Yeah, like, for example, think here's the difference between there's training. Like, say that you want to teach someone how to manage a clustered Linux environment. Okay. That's very different from teaching someone how to design a clustered Linux environment. Ah. I mean, it, they're very different skill sets. That is true. 
So that uh, like or uh, a factory. It's very different to teach someone how to operate the machine that you know, pushes the widget in versus troubleshoot the machine that pushes the widget in. Mm. Or build the machine that pushes the widget. Well, in. usually there would be like you know a document that tells you how to troubleshoot the machine. Like you get a copy machine and it's like it, did this error appear? Look, at, find it in this book. Follow these instructions. You know what happened? My Turn to this page. Follow these instructions. My experience in all my years of enterprise IT, that instruction book for every printer in the world says the following: stand around looking at it, poke at it a few times, call the company and pay them to have someone come in and fix it. <laughs> You no, know, it's <laughs> already, oh, 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 already. Don't forget, don't forget the very important step. Roll it out and look at the back ineffectually for like ten minutes. Already paid for the service contract, so call them without even poking it at all. Yep, uh, that's a separate thing. Nobody in the goddamn world knows how to use their fancy printers. But like, if I was a company, I would actually just buy those fancy printers straight up instead of getting They're the service really contract. They're really easy to administer. Yeah, and fix. And plus, I'd buy the high quality ones. Yeah, because they're great, but no one knows how to use them. I mean, I print stuff double-sided. It's like wizardry. Colors, double-side, folding, binding. Oh, crap. Co collating and sorting. Actually, ours doesn't collate or staple or any of that stuff. Yeah, we don't really need any of that. Because I don't print that. In fact, the only time I print is stupid like metric reports for people that I don't really care about. I don't I, print. Half my job became crystal reports. I don't print. Uh, I wouldn't print if I didn't have to generate crystal reports for people. And they need them printed out? That you can't just email them? Yeah, don't get me Why started. Why don't they get some crystal reports training, and then they can do it themselves? Yeah, I, they want, I wanted crystal reports training, but they didn't give it to me, so I just did it. I just learned how to use it, because it's not that hard. <gasps> you just learned how to use it on your own? That's impossible. Ah, but it took like four hours to make reports, because crystal reports sucks. No. But I can't think of a better tool. SQL. Uh, yeah, you're going to make pretty fancy multi-dimensional graphs that actually do show data correlations just with SQL? Well, no, I'd, I'd do the SQL, then I would take the data that came from the query, put yeah. it into the Excel, and then use that to make the fancy charts. Yeah, Excel makes shit charts. You think so? And for, for that kind of stuff, yeah. It, I'll, I'll show you one of my charts. I'll show you what I did. They're actually pretty good, but that's, that's a separate discussion. <laughs> anyway. We should do a show on like data mining, I think. I don't know enough about data mining. Oh, really? I do a lot of data mining. All right. Anyway... But I think you could actually split corporate training into, you know, forget operational or whatever. The real classes of it, I think, are classes that teach someone who already knows basic IT skills or CS skills a specific tool to do something. Like, you're already an IT guy. Here's how to use Red Hat clustering. Here's how to use DRBD. Mm -hmm. I think that kind of training is actually really useful. I could use that DRBD training. That I did a class on that. We had a guy come in and teach us Postgres and DRBD together, like how to do that. Oh, and I it was need, very focused. It, and, and everyone knew what they were doing. It was like, all right, you want to do something like this? Here's exactly how to do it, how it works, how to troubleshoot it. We're done. Got any questions? I like that. That's a good one. Then there are the non- we, I had a class once that was like, you know, there's a new version of X coming out. Here are the things that have changed in this new version. That right? could be good. What and any questions? And by the way, I'm the guy who made this thing. I'm but the then <laughs> there are the enterprise tool classes. Like you bought this fancy enterprise monitoring system. Here is the training that you bought that costs like ten thousand dollars to teach three of your employees how to use this piece of shit. <laughs> Every kind of training like that I've ever been to in all my years of IT has been absolutely worthless. Yeah, I wish there was a way to like you know figure out before you get the training, like if it's worthless or not? I think it's really easy. Case in point, here's just how I do it. One, is the training for... Like if there's for, a training review site or something like that. Is the training for a proprietary enterprise product? If yes, training will be stupid. <laughs> I, I'm pretty sure that is without exception. But the thing is, a proprietary enterprise product, how can you learn how to use it without the training? It's not like... Yeah, and you know what? The answer is nobody knows how to use it. Not even the trainer? No, no. No, I went to, uh, so Service Desk Express, put out by BMC, I'll call out their stupid names, because whatever, I, I hate them so much, is possibly one of the worst ticketing systems in the world. And the training, basically the manual's useless, it doesn't actually tell you how to use the product. Like half the stuff it tells you, oh, here's how to do this, won't actually work on any scale. And it's inconsistent, and things just don't work the way you expect. So you have to take training to learn how to use the product. Because the training... Almost all enterprise training is aimed at like, the lowest common denominator. Like, they expect people who aren't super techies to be showing up to this training. So the training starts on a level that is pointless baby talk and usually doesn't get much farther than, okay, you started it. 
click the cl- X button to close yep. the window. Here's how, like, and they always focus on very obtuse and complicated parts of the software that no one cares about or will use, and don't even talk about the very important things that aren't actually documented. <laughs> And so did you ask about those things? Yeah, and the instructors usually don't know. Or they do know, and the answer they give you is usually prefaced by, yeah, well, this isn't in the documentation, but here's how you really do it. And it's something complete, like, BS, like, yeah, hack the ASP and insert your JavaScript or whatever. Uh. Or, yeah, go on the back end and do this database update. <laughs> uh. And the classes always start late, end early, and just suck and cost Ludicrous amounts of money. Well, I mean, you know, some com- one company's stupid willing to pay for training. Another company is going to be smart and yep. charge a lot for training. And you'll notice uh, many of the enterprise it's training I've been to, if you ever go to this stuff, you'll see half the people there have been using the product for a long time and the product doesn't work anymore or they have problems and they were sent by their management to the training to learn what they were doing wrong. Why don't, but the thing is, you don't, you, if something is broken, you don't call, you don't get training, you get support. Oh, enterprise support is useless. <laughs> I've never gotten good support from any enterprise level product ever. I don't know if it's enterprise level, but there have been times where I've gotten good support. Like you call oh, out here's where and I get you get the developers from. on the other end. Microsoft has pretty great support. Microsoft does. Even Xbox support is uh, pretty great. TwikiWiki, of all things, actually has pretty good support. Like I've isn't gotten, that an open source thing? Uh, yeah, but sort of. How do you get support for it? Well, there's there, there's Peter Thony and this other guy who are kind of like the main developers for it. And you can post a bug and they'll usually respond. I emailed them and they responded once. Like They answered uh, my uh, questions. Okay. I actually contracted one of them, I forget which one, for like 70 pounds to write a like replication plugin for me. And it worked? It did really well. I eventually phased it out because there was a bug where one day our remote site wasn't available. So it replicated nothing to the local share, <laughs> destroying the entire Twiki. And then when the remote site came back up, it said, oh, there have been changes. And it updated the whole thing again? And th- No, there were changes. So it replicated the empty Twiki to the remote site. Uh, I had to restore the whole thing from tape. Uh, <laughs> tape? Whoa. Yeah. You don't have like the re- you don't use tape for like the week old or at least month old, but you got to keep the more recent ones on discs. Yeah, because it's very rare for me to need a backup of anything. Right, but the point is, is like you got to keep the recentest backups on something that's fast. So you, otherwise, tape. It's like, uh. It depends on how your tapes are set up. What tape is fast? Uh, you, depending on your automated cartridge systems, I've had really fast access to tapes. In fact, at IBM, we had a place where there was a robot, a gigantic robot, that could fetch tapes with such speed that it was ludicrous. Yeah, but the point is, to, re- you have to when you read a tape, you have to read it straight through. You can't scan. And you have to read the whole tape from beginning to end, usually. Yeah. So that could be a pain. Well, I won't get into the details, if you want, but like, suffice a, it to a say, file. enterprise training is mostly useless. Yep. You're better off hiring a consultant to teach you cheaper how to use the product for real than you are getting official support. The thing is, I kind of want to, you know, give training because I feel like I could give training on things I know that's really good. I would be pretty qualified to give training on some of these bullshit enterprise products. Yeah. You know? And judging from the consulting, and rates, I would kind of like doing that if it paid enough. Yeah, get to travel a lot. It, I think it could be fun. Yeah. I just the third know. kind of corporate training is the soft training, like. Leadership or project management. Oh, that's just bullshit. They're just so that's bullshit. That's office space, leap to conclusions crap. The thing is, they could be good. I could imagine a class that teaches like project management. That is like, here's how to deal with sizing. Here's how to actually size an IT project. Here's how budgeting really works and how to really do it. Here's what, you know, as my experience, 20 years being a project manager, here are the things that you'll always fuck up. Here's how you can avoid fucking the them up. The main problem I have with things like that, right, is like somebody will teach you, here's how to size a, a project, right? And they'll say, take all these factors into account, right? Like, you got to worry about this, you got to worry about this, you got to worry about this, yep. right? But they don't actually tell you, like, follow these this exact process to come up with the exact, you know, n- fit number that you're looking for. <laughs> they'll never give you that because it doesn't exist. Right, there's no such thing. So they, you want them to give you something that doesn't exist. Right, but that's that's the point. It's like they're basically telling you, you know, this sort of My my criticism is much more general. I think there's a fundamental flaw in that kind of training. I think the problem is and I noticed this first at RIT with the public speaking classes that I took. Because I, you know, I thought that'd be cool. So I took a long class on public speaking and like oratory and rhetoric. 
And by and large, I found people who are drawn to classes that teach things like leadership or public speaking tend to be terrible at leadership and public speaking and think that they can get better at it by taking a class. So as a result, classes like that tend to focus on things like don't freak out if you're publicly speaking. Don't stutter. Don't, like, pee yourself on stage. So you, can't, so you don't get the advanced topics. Because you don't get the people who are like, don't actually make eye contact, but look at everyone's eyebrows and, you know, you know, look at the audience like 45% of the time between back and forth or, you know, all the tricks that I actually know as a pretty expert public speaker. Yeah, I mean, there was this guy at uh, bar camp this weekend and he was talking about how he's doing this sort of uh, collaborative training, right? Where, like, his idea is that instead of having a trainer, right, they still do have trainers and, and students, but basically his idea is get the students to teach each other right as opposed to having a teacher teach the class right so people will show up and you'll give them a pro a real project to do and they have to team up and do the projects uh, you know and in doing so we'll learn i had a class like that actually during the uh, democratic primaries while we were so at like RIT. If you, yeah so if you wanted to teach someone python for example with this method it would be like all right everyone shows up and you'd be like all right here's what you guys have to make in python Team up together and do it. And in doing so and all working together on it, you will all, you know, by the end of taking many classes over the course of many weeks, uh, learn the Python because you just used it to do a thing. So right? in the lead up to the Democratic primaries for while we were at RIT way back, you know, John Kerry and all that, I took a seminar, a seminar on uh, political theory and there were only like eight people in the class. Gaga. Mm -hmm. So the professor was like, all right, we'll do this as a straight up seminar. And he broke the quarter up, you know, 10 weeks into eight units and had each student teach a unit. So easy for that teacher. Yeah. And you know what? He sat in the audience and asked tough ass motherfucking questions. Hells yeah. And that was possibly the most fun I had in all my time at RIT. Right. Now, see, on paper, that sounds like a good idea. And I don't it only works if everyone involved is motivated and intelligent. Well, he did mention that a lot of people dropped out, but the people who stayed were incredibly motivated and actually would stay extra hours. Yep. Right. And, you know, I definitely believe that people doing in taking this sort of class will learn a lot. You know, and will make, you know, will will definitely make some significant progress. The thing is, uh, like just what you were saying, the people who are in this thing are people who are way down low. And at best, it's going to bring them up to the middle level, right? Unless you have a mediating factor, an instructor who guides. Yeah, but even with the instructor who guides, right, it's like... It's like you you get people who are way down low, mostly learning together with people who are way down low so they can help each other, you know, get to the finish line. But they're not going to learn the, you know, especially when it comes to technology. There is this incredibly high level esoteric stuff, no matter what you're doing, that you're not going to learn. Uh, Scott, the only way to learn that stuff, in my opinion, as is to F run into it doing real work. Uh, two things. One. By having a classical education, so you have just a wide variety of knowledge and experience from school, yep. or just from life. You know, you can get a classical education without going to school. Yep. And two, just by being around long enough to see enough shit. Yeah, but that's the thing is like you, you know. So that's the thing, people. You people have misplaced expectations of training. And I think the, the reason they're misplaced is because they will see people who go to training and succeed. I think the people who succeed as a result of training in most cases... Didn't need the training to begin with. Yeah, they're self-motivated enough to where they would have learned it on their own if given the time. Yep. So the people who see that, they, they have this mystical idea, and you see this in colleges too, that I don't know computers. If I go to a computer school, I'll graduate being a computer expert. Kind of like the tourists who think if I go to New York City, New York City will entertain me. <laughs> I think that's exactly what happens. They think that training is magical, that if I go to training, I will come out knowing everything, not realizing that it takes almost the exact same amount of effort to learn in a training class as it does to learn on your own. And if you don't have the motivation to learn on your own, you're not going to do that well in a class yeah. in most cases. Pretty much the only thing, the only value that I see in getting training, right, as opposed to learn it on my own by doing or reading a book or both or internet or whatever, is that at the training you, if the if the person giving the training is really an expert person, which is not always true, but nope. if they are really an expert person, then you can ask them the questions that you know and get instant full answers, you know, with all the details fleshed out that you might not be able to get from say Stack Overflow or something like that. Yep, like I had a question about because we're you know Python three versus two, there are some differences, 
And I had a question about one of the differences. And the instructor, who actually lectures at PyCon PyCon often, was like, oh, and he basically had as much depth as I wanted, and there was probably a lot more there if I wanted to go deeper. I've also heard stories, right, of people going to things like Apple Developer Conference or Microsoft equivalent of the same thing, you know, whatever they call it these days, right, or, you know, Google's uh dot what do they call it they just had it recently the google uh io right yeah. and you go if you go to those things and you have something that's really really niche like you go to microsoft and you're writing some windows app and you've got a problem with this really deep down like windows something api call somewhere and the msdn documentation isn't enough and no one on stack overflow is helping you so the guy who wrote that is right. there right <laughs> it's not a training it's a developer conference but if you go there you're going to microsoft you're going to google or to apple you can find the guy whose job it is for that thing and you can get the magical answer that you've been looking for you know it's not training but it's the it's in the same way that i think the va- has the same value as training which is direct access in person to the the one or two people on earth who have the expert knowledge in the thing that you're looking for that is so specific right so if it's a good trainer it almost doesn't matter if the training is worthless because if you have a problem you're basically paying those thousands whatever to get the answer to that question that you so desperately need so it's like you know, you can build up a whole list of questions. And if you get them all answered, look at the price and figure out if it was worth it. Like, would you have paid to get those answers? Yep. You know? I mean, I guess my thesis. But then this- again, you could just do the same thing by hiring that trainer as a consultant for a day to ask him the questions. There's, there's a blurred line between when you go to training, ver- like a lot of training places offer, hey, we'll just send the instructor to your company. Uh, however many people you want to sit in the room can sit in the room and we'll do whatever you want me to do. Yeah. That's actually usually, I think, a great idea. It's the same thing as a consultant, though. It is a consultant. If you hire a consultant, you can tell the consultant to do work, or you can tell them to, you can just ask them questions, or you could have them trained. You could have them do whatever you want. Yeah. But I guess my thesis on all this, because you know, I'm in training right now, and it's actually pretty good, but I could have done without the training. I am looking forward to, in July, I'm going to a C++ boot camp, which is basically, it's actually probably slightly above my level of coding. C++, which is slowly fading. Yes, but... Very slowly. It's like the slowest fade in the possible yeah, universe. It'll be useful to me because in the enterprise world, a lot of things are written in C++, and being an engineer in the manner that I am, I often need to interface between guy who wrote a complex multi-threaded C++ or C or Objective-C daemon and someone who is not that technical. And I have to be able to mediate between the two. Like, say an operations guy finds what he thinks is a bug, but he can't describe, like, he knows what's not going right, but he doesn't know why it's not going right. And the engineer who wrote the demon doesn't know enough about the business process to figure out what went wrong. You need someone who knows the IT side and the business side and can actually look at the code and understand what the demon was trying to do to explain to the developer, here's what really happened. There's a thread condition that happened. The thing is, I don't understand why you need Python training and C++ training. I mean, C++ oh, is Oh, no, weird. because I wanted C Sharp training because that'll actually be really useful to me. And they, said it, and they decided that C Sharp... There wasn't a good business case for me learning it in the company. But the thing is, right, why do you need training for more than one language, period? It's like if you can, you know, you, you, just, you just look up the syntax and you'll be able to read any language. Mostly because the boot camp for C++, I think, would have really forced me to learn more better coding practices. No, it doesn't. C++ isn't going to teach you good. It's going to teach you bad coding. Nah, we'll see. <laughs> you see, C++ is basically, it's an object-oriented language, but you can also write in C, kind of, and it's also, the syntax is a complete mess. There's all sorts of crazy symbols everywhere. Yep. No, but, I like Python, and this is the training I wanted. C++ was kind of my silver medal because I couldn't get what I really wanted. But, if, you know, if you can read, you know, if you can read any programming language, you can probably read the C++, and if you see a weird symbol, just look it up. You don't yeah. need training for it. Yeah, but that, you know, training happens. I work in enterprise. But anyway, I guess my thesis in all this is that training, a lot of companies will send people on training when really they would be much better off giving the people the time to learn it either at home with like, like, hey, take a week off and learn this thing. Or, hey, don't do any work but learning this thing. Because the people who are motivated will learn the thing regardless of whether they go to training or you give them time. And the people who aren't motivated aren't going to learn any more at the training than they're going to learn if you give them the time off. Mm -hmm. So, really, you should just figure out who you think is not motivated and never let them learn anything. 
and if possible, get rid of them <laughs> and hire someone who is motivated. Yeah, but I mean, what you know, there might be someone who uh, you know they might not be motivated to learn new things, but they are good at a thing already, and you need that thing that they all right. Already so know. you keep them then, yeah. but. What if they need to learn something else and they're not motivated? Don't send them to training if you know they're not going to learn. That's obvious. Yeah, definitely. But I think a lot of companies send people to training thinking that, that that will somehow make them learn. A lot of times you're just better off hiring someone else who knows the thing that you need to know rather than training someone you already have. Yep. Or hiring a consultant or outsourcing or all those things. I guess yeah, I it's think like, huh, I've got these guys. They all know X. I need uh, – suddenly we got product Y coming in here. Do I train these guys in product Y or just hire someone who already knows product Y? That's of so course, much at easier. the same time, too many job postings require very specific knowledge of specific things that almost no one's actually going to know. Well, that's, you know... <laughs> Separate problem. Yeah. But companies put way too much stock in training and don't trust their workers nearly enough. If you're paying someone a lot of money because you the, uh, nominally understand that they're intelligent, you're paying them for the fact that they're an intelligent person who can make decisions. If you then... Ex- like don't trust them to be motivated enough to learn something that's important to their job on their own, then why are you paying the smart person? You could get someone less skilled to do the same job. Yeah, it's like if you don't, if you're not gonna let someone make a decision, why do you need to hire someone who's smart enough to make a decision? Hire someone who is incapable of making a decision, and you'll pay them a lot less, and you'll make all the decisions that you're already making. And if your company ever buys really big and bloated enterprise software and you get to go to training, think of it as a week-long vacation somewhere boring. It could be in Vegas. Yeah, usually the training ends up being in North Carolina or down by D.C. Actually, a lot of it's in the financial district, so you get to go to New York. This has been Geek Nights with Rim and Scott. Special thanks to DJ Pretzel for the opening music, Cat Lee for web design, and Brando K for the logos. Be sure to visit our website at frontrowcrew.com for show notes, discussion, news, and more. Remember, Geek Nights is not one, but four different shows. SciTech Mondays, Gaming Tuesdays, Anime Comic Wednesdays, and Indiscriminate Thursdays. Geek Nights is distributed under a Creative Commons Attribution 3.0 license. Geek Nights is recorded live with no studio and no audience. But unlike those other late shows, it's actually recorded at night. 